Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm Junior Doan. Thank you for joining me. Today I'm with Mitzi Perdue, whose father founded the Sheraton Hotel chain and whose late husband was the poultry magnate, Frank Perdue. Mitzi is a speaker, businesswoman, and author of How to Keep Your Family Connected and How to Make Your Family Business Last. Welcome, Mitzi. So you've had a long interest in family relationships, being good over generations. How did that come about? Well, my interest in it came about because I noticed that one of the biggest ingredients in happiness or misery is how, long, how well you're getting along with your family. And I feel that I've been really blessed because my family began in 1840, uh, or at least the family bu business began in 1840, and we've had reunions ever since 1890, so we're about to celebrate our 129th. And I always do a survey of, of family members, asking them what this means to them. And they say it's being part of a loving, supporting family is one of the best things in their lives. And I have the same experience with the Purdue family. We've been in business since 1920, about to celebrate our 100th anniversary. And yeah, you know, when things go well, they're just bliss. And when there's a little wrinkle in it, oh, it attacks your soul. How do soul. you learn to handle the blips uh, of individuals? Well, I'll, I'll speak of the Henderson family. Okay. And yeah, you know, there, there doesn't exist a family that doesn't have conflict. I mean, there's just no such thing. So right. the big thing is how do you handle it? Yes. And we have several rules in the Henderson family that I, and in the, in the Purdue family too, but let me speak for the moment, uh, focus on one family. We, we have rules, like one of them is, we say, and we were taught from childhood, we don't wash our dirty linen in public. And what that means is we keep our quarrels within the family. It's, now, ways of handling conflict is, we insist that you've got a gripe, we want you to get it out as soon as possible. You, we want you to get a complete full hearing. You know, don't bottle something up inside. But. The rule was you can't go to the press about an issue and you can't go to a lawyer, a lawyer who would be representing you alone in an adversarial situation against your relatives. And the wisdom of that, I mean, I don't know how much my family thought through, but I'll tell you what we know in 2019. I've talked with dozens and dozens and dozens of family counselors and I've also talked, uh, well, read books on the subject and here's what we know today that if, you, if your family quarrel reaches the point where you take it to the press or you take it to a lawyer, that's almost a bridge too far. There are almost no families who can pull back from that and have a good, strong, intact family after they've gone to lawyers. Well, what have you learned about um, quieting it down and having people feel understood and even resolving the issue? What are some of the techniques the family uses or has used over the years? Okay, year? well, there's several, but I think one of the absolute biggest is being really heard goes a long, long way. Oh, so, interesting. All right, so that's one thing. Uh, another is we try very hard not to, like, stand on principle because you might stand on principle in other parts of your life, but inside a family, if I'm stand, if I say, I'm standing on principle. That's saying I'm not listening to your side. That's saying I'm morally superior. That shuts down conversation. Oh, interesting. And, yeah. and we're very against shutting down conversation. Another thing, it, and I'm referring not just to my own family, although my own family, the Hendersons or the Purdue's are definitely part of this, but it helps absolutely no end to have almost the equivalent of a constitution. And what I mean by that is a mechanism that you all agree on 
for solving oh. problems. So when a decision is made, you can be at each other's throats if need be, but when the decision is made, the, in the Hendersons and the Purdue's, the, the ethic is you come together. And I can give a very personal example of this. Please do. I grew up in the Henderson family, my, and I mentioned that my family began in 1840, but one of the things, the family's been in dozens of business since, including like ostrich feathers, subway systems, tire factories, but the one that was possibly the most visible was my father founded the Sheraton Hotel Corporation. He was, well, he was co-founder and president of it. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up a Sheraton heiress. I mean, trust me, that's fun. Yeah. But when my father died, and it was unexpectedly, he was only 70, mm. suddenly, you know, my siblings and I had the question of, well, what do we do with this company? And there were a whole lot of very strong, serious reasons to sell. And the two men in the family, both my two brothers, both have business school degrees. And yeah, you know, they understood a lot more about business than I did at 26. And my two sisters, yeah, you know, they're 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 not business minded. So we were operating on emotion. You know, we can't sell it. It's our father's legacy. It's our identity. Nobody's going to care about the employees as much as we do. Yes. You know, we just can't do it. Uh, our two brothers had you know, really strong, serious business reasons why this was the exactly right time to sell. And it was, when you have an argument over your identity, and this was an identity argument because you know, we, this is who we were and suddenly it's being ripped away from you, the feelings are just white hot. And I think at that point it would have been so easy for the family just to explode over it. Mm -hmm. But we had this rule that we could argue in person but we didn't wash our dirty linen in public. We made a decision. And it wasn't strictly by vote because yeah, the two brothers would have won. It was more they had to pull us over. And when the decision was made, and I wasn't happy with the decision, but we did follow what our rule was, which is when it's made, you pull together. You know, uh, so I was growing up in New York and they talked about these fantastic baseball players, and when I found out that it was only 300 and some that out of a thousand hits that made them good, I said, one out of three, and that's the best? I mean, it taught me right away then to have not modesty, but at least a questioning <laughs> attitude about my own um, thoughts on things, you know, is there a better way, you know? And well, that reminds me of something fantastic that Frank was just famous for, and I got to watch it up close and personal. He loved to have dissent because uh, his view was none of us is as smart of, as all of us. And oh, that, I love that. Oh, isn't that good? Yeah. And when he'd go into a room, I mean, he's the big boss because he was the person who right. grew the company from no employees to 20,000 at the time of his death. But one of his, one of his ways of doing this was he had no tolerance for yes men. He didn't want to hear you know, that he was wonderful or anything. He, positively disliked that. What he really loved was to hear what's wrong because he could do something about it. And then on top of that, when there was dissent, instead of, well, let me tell you a story about it. Please do. Uh, it's a story that uh, there was a guy, and we're talking probably 30 years ago, he had just been hired in the company and he was a salesman. And it's his first week in the company and he's sitting around a big mahogany table with like eight other people in the sales force and Frank Perdue was there, and the the current head of the sales team was, uh, you know, probably five layers down in management. But nevertheless, that guy was at one end of the table, and Frank was at the other. And they were arguing all day long, just you know, at each other's throats practically. And yeah, this guy who's who's watching this is thinking, oh, this is terrible. They hate each other. And then it got worse. The man's name was Jack Tatum, by the way. Jack Tatum told me that. It escalated to the point where Don Mabe, the guy at the far end of the table, got so mad that he pulled his glasses off, <laughs> threw them down on the table. The glasses bounced once, hit Frank square in the chest. And, and while all that's going on, Don Mabe is telling Frank, why don't you take up hang gliding? <laughs> and, and you know, this is somebody who 
works for Frank. Frank's name is on his paycheck. And, and Jack Tatum's t telling me that he's afraid that he's joined the company at the exact moment where it all falls apart. Or, yes, right. Uh, but instead, uh, they were arguing over whatever it was. They came to a decision. At the end of it, they, they walk out of the room practically with their arms around each other, joking. I think when you engage, you uh, both separate and attach because you care about an outcome one well, way or another. Well, Frank loved it. It's that the thrilling guy, relationship. Yeah, Frank loved it that the guy cared enough. And the PS to this story, uh, when Frank retired as president, Don Mabe was the person he chose to succeed him. So the person who stood up to him the most forcefully, I mean, it's pretty forcefully to tell somebody to take up hang gliding. Uh, True. But, but that's all in the context of that Frank really valued dissent and he loved hearing other opinions. What did he look for when he hired someone? Uh, he said that he wasn't terribly impressed by by the name of the school you went to. I mean, if you were in Ivy League, that, that was not going to be what impressed him most. And it wasn't even the grades that got you that impressed him most. What really impressed him was personality. Is this somebody who's, uh, who can really get along with people, who can inspire people, and you know, who can give others a better vision of themselves. So, I love that. So that's, that, that's what he told me he was looking for. And then he chose you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> which was nice. I was really happy that he did. A different life. Uh, well, let's see, hotels to chicken is a great big change. Yes, but, but I, and communication too. But nevertheless, I thought that I, I, I was just divinely happy with him. He was, he was very easy to get along with because he was very even-tempered. Oh, that's a gift. And we've, we almost never quarreled. I mean, we might have what I would call a spring thunderstorm or something, but it's over in minutes or hours. It's not days. Right. And he practiced one of the things that, that the Henderson family preaches, which is listen. And so whatever grievance I had, uh, I felt totally listened to, and I felt that he listened fairly. And it's really hard to have a great big bang up argument with somebody who's being fair. That's true, that's true. I mean, it's just really hard to do. <laughs> well, sometimes, this, sometimes the understandings are different. You know, what's really important to you or me or someone may not be known as well in terms of value system to the person who's receiving, you know, the, the words. And then they learn from it that you have a different value system or that you have, in this particular case, um, that, that it's more important than it seems. And once well, then, you do then some, that... Something else that Frank did on that subject that just left me just amazed at, at how effective it was. But for him, family harmony, and he was, family harmony was extremely important. And if, say he's saying goodbye in the morning and about to go out the door, and he can see by my face, and he was good at reading me, you know, that Mitzi wasn't all overjoyed with the universe at that moment, he'd close the door and would sit down on a bench near the, fr the front door and he'd ask what was wrong. And, but the kicker to this is the time that I have in mind and I'm describing right now, I know he had a board meeting. Oh. I know that being prompt was just, I mean, he was, I never knew anybody more prompt. I mean, he was to the second and that he was willing to be late for a board meeting to solve whatever the thing was. I mean, the, the, the message that sends is, Frank, it's, I'll, it's okay, it's okay. You've done a lot of things in your life. How do you know when to move on professionally? That's an interesting question at this exact point in my life because I've put four years of my life into studying public speaking. I have a little business going on and I can't believe how much they pay me. Yay! Good. Uh, and it started out with uh, my taking a year-long course in public speaking with the National Speakers Association. I've devoted probably eight hours a day to studying and, and doing what you need, but I'm at the moment, I want to use everything that I've learned in public speaking, but how do you decide to move on? There's an opportunity that excites me so much that the speaking business 
becomes less important. I mean, I still hope I do lots of public speaking, but I'm going to do it for a cause now rather than for making money. And I've got no objections to making money, but, but the cause that excites me so much, it's one, I think it's getting increasing attention, and that's human trafficking. And by, by that I mean, well, human trafficking, another word for it is slavery. Oh, yes. And about 76% of that is sexual exploitation, and very often it's children. Oh. And to the extent that, that any of us can do anything to save a child from what has to be total hell, um, I think that's how I want to spend the rest of my life. And how do you see that playing out? Well, I had an idea about a month ago. I heard a lecture on the subject, a guy named Paul H Hutchinson. And he was telling about efforts that he has, super high-tech, fantastic ways of creating stings where you, where you catch the traffickers. Hmm. I mean, because too often it's the, it's the prostitutes who end up in jail. I mean, yeah. we want the bad guys in jail. Right. Well, he made such a case of what it means to a girl to be rescued and then rehabilitated, because part of what he does is that, that I thought, I really would like to help. But it's a little difficult because if you have something of a philanthropic nature, you probably stretch as far as you possibly could to take care of the ones you already know about and suddenly to want to contribute to another organization. But I thought, I have something of value that I could sell. And it's, a, it's come down in my family. It's a, 15, a 16th century uh, desk that belonged to a de' Medici cardinal. Oh my goodness. And I thought I could sell that. And the money from that could go to Paul Hutchinson's anti-trafficking effort. But then it occurred to me, I bet in this world, there are a great many people in exactly my situation who have things that they could sell even if they don't have free cash to write a check with. I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But, right. but in my case, that was my situation. So I started thinking, what if there were an auction what if there were an, a global auction for anti-trafficking and it would be in two tiers. The top tier is a celebrity auction where people, you can't even get into this auction. <laughs> you can't make a donation to the top tier unless it's worth a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. And guess what? There, there are probably 40 people right now who are kind of fighting to get into this. And because you've talked to them about it. Because I've talked with them about it. And uh, I'll tell you some of the things we have right now. Uh, and in, in the months to come, you'll, you'll hear more because I intend to... Well, when is the auction the scheduled au for? The auction is January of 2021. Oh, okay. And, okay, here's some of the things that will be auctioned. Okay. The largest perfect emerald in the world. There's a person who has 12 uh, plates that belong to Tsar Alexander II. Oh. I think they're like possibly 200 years old. And then I'm, I'm putting up the de' Medici desk. But the people who are interested in this, uh, they're people whose names you've heard. And I'm, I'm creating a rule for this, which is if you're far to the right politically, we are only going to let you in if you come in with somebody who's far to the left. So whether you're Hollywood, uh, media, commentators, whoever. Pull people together, good for you. Well, because I want to be absolutely certain that this isn't Republican or Democrat, but it's also global. Because I was talking just a few days ago with a guy who's very connected with Alibaba. Oh. And he said, I mentioned there are two tiers to this thing. Yes. All right, the top tier is the celebrity auction. And I believe that's going to get a lot of attention because I know even royal families of Europe, and I can't say the names yet, but who are interested in being part of this. Because if, if you're very, very wealthy, there's an awfully good chance that you have goodies that maybe are in storage. Or right. maybe you want to de-acquisition something yes. and put something else up. So it's not that hard to get fabulous items. Uh, but the second tier is for everybody else, where maybe you've got an item that's worth $100. Well, the guy I was talking with who's connected with Alibaba, he said he thinks that China would be very, very interested in this. And I've already been invited to come to talk in 
three cities in China and Hong Kong about this, so it's going to be totally global. I like that. And, and my absolute... Is there a minimum in the second auction, or is it just that it's not a celebrity? Uh, the, the, it, anything below a quarter of a million. If it's okay. above that, you're, you're eligible for the celebrity auction. Okay. Uh, for below that, the, the guy I was talking with who's connected with Alibaba, he said, and I'm not sure I got the figures right, but hundreds of millions of people are, have something called Alibaba Pay. So imagine that there's a global day where, where this auction takes place, and imagine like the world's talking about it, and you have, uh, you get to see in the auction the face of Mr. So and So, yes. who's who's bid five hundred thousand and somebody six hundred thousand. Uh, supposing that you're, and I'm describing right now what my Chinese friend told me. He said, imagine that you're somebody in China, maybe in a fairly small town, and you're really moved by the stories of, of rescued children, and you want to contribute something, with, with Alipay, you can have the equivalent of one dollar. And what if you have a couple of hundred million people contributing a dollar? Really? Interesting. And then something else that I'm dreaming of, I would love it if in many countries there was a person who was head of it for, like China, or Japan, or Argentina, or oh, good England, idea. or whatever. Yes. Because, and the, the biggest question is, where does the money go? The money goes in the following way. Uh, there, I believe there are a thousand, this is a guess, I think there are probably a thousand anti-trafficking organizations. That's from internet research, and maybe there's more, but I think there's in that range. You, you've got some Let's imagine that you've got a beautiful silver tray or something, or a tea set, and you're putting it up for the auction. You tell Alibaba, or eBay if eBay chooses to come, come on, you say, this, this will be designated to whichever anti-trafficking organization you care about or who brought it to your attention. And I'm assuming that the majority of it will go to Paul Hutchinson's organization, but any anti-trafficking organization that wants to participate and get their members to participate in the auction uh, can Who benefit from it. Who are you getting to help you on this? This is a big job. I, you know, I was thinking of that just before coming here. Uh, this is a big job. I, I guess I'll be hiring people. Well, good for you. But I'm also hoping that there. Are, if, if my dream that in different countries, different people are responsible for it, then I think my overall job is, my hobby is computer database programming, so I'm very adept at keeping, I shouldn't, that's boastful. I know how to <laughs> uh, okay. create databases. Right. And, and I can track these things probably better than people who don't have that oh, certainly. training. So what would be the, just, just give me five things you're going to do in what order uh, to affect this. All right, the number one is I'm putting, I'm creating a website right now. Okay. And I, I now own three different names. Okay. And gosh, I wish people could give me feedback on which is the best name for the domain name. And the, the ones that I own are antitraffickingauction.com mm -hmm. or abbreviated uh, the the abbrevi abbreviation for global anti trafficking uh, dot com would be g a hyphen t a dot com, or I also own a hyphen t a dot com, and I guess I want to get a lot of feedback on which is the best. All right, so I'm creating a website. We're, okay, we're, that's one. Number two, I'm creating a newsletter, and oh, that's good. And I have the ability to send that out to millions lots, of people. Lots, lots. I mean, yes. knowing database programming really takes you a long way. Yes. So anybody who's listening to us who wants to write to Mitzi, I think it's going to be Mitzi at a hyphen ta dot org. Okay. So there's going to be a newsletter that will tell people. Then another thing that's ongoing, so it's not like one step, but I'm lining up at a furious pace the the people who are donating. Good for you. And at the moment, I can't. Well, no, don't say that. Will that has its time? But but it will come. It's out. nice that people take your call and say yes to you. 
So that's well, a that, compliment to you. Well, that's a huge advantage of, of being old. Right. <laughs> because in my years, I've met people. And the next step after that? Let's see, that was three? Three. Uh, the next step after that, I want to line up. I'm, I'm meeting with somebody from Alibaba who you know, can hopefully say, yes, do this. Yes. I want to do the same thing with eBay. Good. And I also, there's a local auction, which I don't want to say their name yet. Don't. Because, okay, but they've said they're very interested, but they haven't signed on the dotted line. So I'd like to have the mechanics of all of that lined up. Uh, I think that's four. The fifth one, and again, this is something I'm working on right now, in my database of, of anti-trafficking organizations, I want to write to each one of them. And it will be fairly personal. It's not going to be a mass emailing, inviting them to be part of this. Because if they contribute, if, they, if their members contribute, they get the money. Thank you, Bitsy. So before, uh, we've learned quite a bit about this. It's very uh, good to be entrepreneurial. It's very good to educate yourself. She throws herself all in, the speakers, learning the data uh, background, a number of things. She is fearless in taking on new things. And she's quite compassionate. It comes out of family living where they emphasize getting along and more importantly, perhaps as a prelude to getting along, is really listening to people, especially when they're upset, and gave a couple of examples of this, this you can do in your life. And so bringing that passion, this happens to be for children, forward, worldwide, go Mitzi. And in your life, you can do the same thing. Pick your thing, research it, make it happen. And thank you for joining us this time. I look forward to having you with me again. And remember, do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know every day of your life. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Mitzi. That was wonderful. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.